microcosm for the rest of the country. Things are really bad down there, even now. Some of you may have seen that HBO report last year that talked about the Little Rock schools. It is very bad. If you haven't seen it, get, get it out of the archives and take a look. So, with that sort of preamble and preliminary opening to our dialogue, we're going to start right now talking together. And what we will do is simply ask you to stand and ask your questions in place, wherever you are. Speak loudly from the diaphragm so that everyone can hear. And then we're off and running. And whoever has the first question, you're on. I don't know who you are. But there you are. Stand right up. Let me ask you if you would take a stab at answering that. What would you say? I, I would say yes, but I'd like for you to talk about that. We often hear about um, the animosity from the students, but we never hear uh, about what you felt or what you went through right. in the classes every day. Good question. Yeah, the, and you're right. The answer is yes, in fact. The, and when you have to realize that these teachers were not... Uh, Imported from Chicago, these were folk from Little Rock. They were not happy to see things change this way. They were not happy to see us, certainly. My English teacher hated me with a passion that was as pure as anything else you've ever seen. She asked me one day the question, why do you want to come to our school? Why don't you go back to your own school? Which is a fairly idiotic question when you think about it, because she has in that question the assumption that you can divide up these publicly owned institutions into racial group ownership, i.e. her school and my school. It didn't make any sense. Now, fortunately, in any group of people, you will not find monolithic thoughts. So there were a range of thought patterns. And at the other extreme, there were people who actually supported our being there. They were few in number, maybe one or two, really. The majority of them were uncertain about what to do, but leaned toward not accepting. They were unfriendly, or they were, how you say, uh, overtly friendly. But underneath, there was something else. Yeah. And that's another thing, for kids especially, you have to develop skills of ascertaining what is going on with people around you. Looking through the surface and seeing beyond that. In order to do that, you have to be well equipped yourself. You have to know and understand a lot of things. So it's imperative to, to work really hard to, to learn the lessons of life. Some of which has to do with schoolwork, but that's minor. See, schoolwork is actually minor. The lessons of life go far beyond that. Thank you for that. So after the first question comes question two. <laughs> it goes like that. There you are, way in the back. Yes, there were white students in the beginning, especially, who were helpful to us. They were quickly persuaded, however, to give up that because they were told, if you continue that behavior, we will beat you up. The social sanctions were severe. So after the students were told this, they backed off because nobody wanted to volunteer themselves to get beaten up. And that was tragic. There were a few students who persisted, however, I count them among the very, very few people in the world. Robin Woods is a good example. Robin is a young woman who shared her algebra book with me. I was in an algebra class one day and I had no book. Often I had no books because if I would walk down the hall with books, they would routinely be kicked out of my arms and destroyed on the spot. So I was, many times, had no books at all. And this particular day I had no books and Robin pulled her desk close to mine and we shared her book. That action was really bizarre for the people in the room because one of the real taboos then and now was the interaction between a white female and a black male. So she was just confronting all the taboos at once. She caught hell as a consequence of that. But she hung in there. She was the kind of person who had grown up in a household where parents taught her to treat every other single human being in the universe as her peer and they actually believed what they were saying. You know, a lot of kids grow up in households where parents will tell them rhetoric. Oh, we love everybody. 
we are open-minded and liberal, and we want to, oh, yeah, and then the kid comes home one day with one of these others as a guest. The parents go ballistic. Wow, what is it? Oh, excuse us. Then there's a quick conference in the kitchen. <laughs> the is the real message. Don't you know? And then they come back out and says, oh, you're so nice. We'll see you later. <laughs> Surface civility, you see, but no real acceptance. That was not Robin's case. She was genuine from start to finish. She still lives in Little Rock, by the way. We're in touch. We talk all the time. And she still despairs about the fact that a lot of her age group peers have not changed. They're still very much in support of a separatist kind of society, maintaining those walls of segregation. That causes her grief, and rightly so, because it is an insane way to live. Yes, sir. Stand right up. Oh, at the Little Rock School Board? Good question. Well, once I figured out that the school board was not being genuine, I decided that I needed to do something to expose what was going on. In fact, I invited the superintendent in the first week of my tenure to give me a complete list of all the known bigots in the system. I asked him if he would just give me that list because it would make my work a lot easier if I could just go locate these folks right off the bat. He wouldn't do it. He refused. I later ascertained that the primary reason for his refusal was that his name would have to be the first one. So I went about investigating the system to find out what was going on. And what I determined was that that whole system needed to be revamped top to bottom. So I put together a proposal. This is part of my guerrilla activity. I proposed a training program, six months mandatory personal growth. And I made it mandatory because I knew nobody would come otherwise. I gave it to the school board. They sat on it for months. They sat on that plan for about nine months. And after nine months, which I considered to be a proper gestation period anyway, I secured a spot on the school board agenda. They meet on Thursday nights, and it's televised on local cable. My planned presentation included update of my activities as a consultant. I did. I gave an update, and then after that synopsis, I casually mentioned the proposal that I had submitted, gave a brief overview of the proposal, and then said to all the cable audience, I've not heard a word from the school board that I sat down. And by the time I got to the hotel room, the phone was ringing off the hook. See, that's what will happen if you engage in guerrilla warfare. You, you will attract attention. <laughs> but it was the kind of attention they didn't want. But they were forced, in the face of that public pressure, to okay the plan. We ran five or 600 people through that six-month training program before I got fired. Yes. I noticed all the moves. See, that was just a grooming move. So, <laughs> stand right up. At Central? Oh, good question. His question, was I ever in any extracurricular activities at Central? Great question. No. We, the nine, had to sign an affidavit that we would not engage in any extracurricular activities. We were not eligible to be in anything. We could go to class, that was it. Then we had to go home. Which was one of the compromises because we, even though we didn't like that, the school made it clear that if you don't sign and if you try to engage in extracurricular activities, the whole experiment's off. So it was that. Uh, and, and one of the reasons why they did not want the black kids interacting with the white kids after school because they figured, and rightly so, that the prejudices would probably fall away over time. And the folk who were supporting, maintaining segregation knew that they couldn't do that. They knew this from the start. In fact, the very first plan to desegregate in Little Rock did not even include high schoolers. It was going to be kindergarten through third grade. Kindergarten through third grade would work in any community. When's the last time you read about a race riot in kindergarten? <laughs> They're rare, if that they happen at all. And so everybody in Little Rock knew this. They were very happy. They forced the school board to get rid of that very reasonable plan. They came back with rage 